the gallery. Yeah, go to the I'm gallery. I'm just saying, I'm slacking you right now. My final word. I'm sorry. This. Black people have been 30% of the deaths from the coronavirus, COVID-19, despite the fact that we are only 13.4% of the population. And that's not because of the way that the virus attacks, but because of the circumstances that certain communities have had to endure for generations. The health disparities puts them at risk for diseases much more so than the general population. That's also explained by structural racism. This video recorded on a cell phone in a Walmart in Illinois shows two black men being escorted out of the store, they say, for wearing a protective mask. He's following us right now to the store. We're being asked to leave for being safe. But even with medical masks, I'm sure there are many black people who are afraid that just because I'm covering my face, people are going to be suspicious of me. You should never call the police on anyone that's trying to protect themselves. This is decades and decades of disinvestment. And when you tack on the social and economic drivers that have been driven by structural racism, it's hard to think that African Americans are not going to continue to take the burden from this pandemic. I know this is hard and I know this is scary, but I just want to encourage you to stay home, stay informed, stay connected to friends and family. Yes, together we will get through this. This too shall pass. So let's continue to focus on the fight and not the fright. My hope is that we're able to recognize the role that race has played in this so that we can come to some real solutions. ABC7 presents Race and Coronavirus, a Bay Area conversation. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for this special edition of ABC7 News. Instead of our 4 p.m. newscast, today we're going to spend an hour engaging experts and you, our viewers, in an ABC7 Listens virtual town hall on the issue of race and coronavirus. This is an important one-hour virtual town hall airing on TV on abc7news.com and Facebook. Earlier this month, we talked about how the coronavirus affected the Chinese-American community. And today we are taking a closer look at the African-American community. So over the next hour, we are having a frank conversation with a panel of experts. And I'm going to be taking questions from you who are watching us right now. 
We're going to start with a look at the issue from the start and watch it as it unfolded across the country. We have a personal story from right here in the Bay Area too, because even if you don't know anyone with an issue like this, you'll see why it affects all of us. It's showing up uh, very strongly in our data on the African-American community. And we're doing everything in our power to address this challenge. It's a tremendous uh, challenge. At the beginning of April, we started learning something about this mysterious coronavirus that still has a grip on much of the world. The disease is disproportionately impacting black Americans. Data is still limited, but here's a slice. The New York City Health Department says black people are twice as likely to die from the disease than their white counterparts. A new CDC study surveyed eight Georgia hospitals and a sample of 305 coronavirus patients, 247 were black. That's more than 80%. Cities like Chicago, New Orleans, and Wisconsin are finding these trends too. California looks different. Black people make up 6% of the state population, 6.5% of confirmed coronavirus cases, and 10.7% of the deaths. The state is missing 35% of its racial data. Dr. Kirsten Bibbins Domingo is chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF. We know that testing wasn't rolled out um, in the same way in all communities. Um, and if people can't get tested um, early on, um, they are both at risk of spreading it um, as well as at risk of more serious complications. We know that access to care is not the same everywhere. Health disparities have always existed for the African-American community. But here again, with the crisis how, it's shining a bright light on how unacceptable that is. There's a lot to unpack historically when looking at the relationship between black people and white health care providers. You can go back to the 1932 Tuskegee experiment. The federal government conducted a 40-year study to observe untreated syphilis on black men. Participants were only told they were getting free health care. Or fast forward to 2020, the coronavirus, and a 30-year-old teacher from Brooklyn who wasn't admitted to the hospital for her COVID-19 symptoms until her third visit. ABC News says Rana Munjan died on April 27th. These numbers and stories may seem far away, but they're here too. So I'm bringing it closer to home for all of us with a story out of Oakland. 56-year-old Terry Blanchard was a dedicated father, husband, and board president of the East Oakland Youth Development Center. My dad was all about empowering people, um, giving people opportunities. Sydney would never want to change that about her father. It's his legacy, but it ultimately led to both of her parents getting the coronavirus. They helped out a friend who had fallen on hard times. That person came back to the house and infected them both. Sydney says her mother had more traditional symptoms and got a test but not her father. He just had more gastrointestinal symptoms at first, so a week of what we would normally look at as like a stomach flu. After a week of high fever, then came pneumonia. Terry Blanchard finally got a COVID-19 test, positive. After two days, his oxygen saturation started to go down and my mom took him uh, to the hospital. And that first day they were like, oh, you know, he's going to be fine. You know, he's not doing that bad. You know, it's just the pneumonia. Terry Blanchard's condition declined that night. He was put on a ventilator the next morning. And after 14 days, he died on Easter Sunday. I didn't get to say anything to him before he went under um, or anything. Um, and then not being able to, you know, comfort my mom because I can't have any contact with her. Sydney ended our conversation with a clear message. Learn as much as you can. If you have someone who is sick with the virus, you know, look into how you can help them. But mostly if they land up in the hospital, advocate for them. Because the doctors don't have time to keep up. So much heartbreak in our world right now and a lot of angles to discuss with our live panel today. We are your hosts, your moderators. I'm Anna Dates along with my colleagues, Jobina Fortz and Kumasi Aaron. We have gathered together an insightful group today. Joining us is Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Charles Collins, hello, President and Chief Executive Officer of the YMCA of San Francisco.
Man, who's the president and CEO of Greenlining Institute, and Eva Patterson, who is the co-founder of the Equal Justice Society. Have Dr. Monica McLemore, associate professor with UCSF Family, Family Healthcare Nursing, and Pendarvis Harshaw, author and host at KQED. Welcome and thank you all so much for being here with us. Happy to be with you. Thank you. Well, let's just jump right into it. Um, we'll start with you, um, Dr. McLemore, um, especially because you are our health expert on this panel. That is probably uh, the biggest headline with the coronavirus, but there's so much that goes into this. Can we talk about why this is happening? Why are we seeing so many black Americans disproportionately impacted across the country? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for having this important discussion with our colleagues. And I want to shout out all the healthcare workers, the food workers, the hotel workers, all of the essential people who are, are taking good care of us. We thank you and we're very grateful for you. Um, last year in 2019, when the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, coronavirus shortened to COVID-19 emerged, um, we had a novel virus and a novel illness with multi-organ involvement that to date has infected 2.6 million people around the world, and the numbers are climbing. And one of the reasons we are seeing such disparities and such discrepancies is this global pandemic has really shuttered economies, as well as exposed some longstanding um, inequities that are associated with structural racism, the divestment of our crucial public health infrastructure, and quite frankly, is laying bare the intersections between the social determinants of health um, the inadequate uh, uh, providers and, and positions of care that we've historically had, and um, really laying bare the health inequities that were already in existence prior to the global pandemic. In the work that I do working with uh, Black people with the capacity for pregnancy, we already knew that we had a Black maternal health crisis that was going on prior to COVID. And so what we're really seeing now is, you know, everything from you know, the removal of human rights to the changes in informed consent in terms of how we allocate care. And we're seeing a pitting of healthcare workers against the patients and the community, exact communities where we're, we're looking to serve. So it's, in my opinion, it's been an exacerbation of issues that many of us in public health, quite frankly, uh, have been bringing attention to for a long time. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between healthcare workers and our community? You mentioned it really quickly there, but I'd like to dive deeper a little more into that. Well, one of the things that we've known for a long time within the healthcare workforce is that there has been mistreatment and disrespect of Black people seeking healthcare across the continuum for, for as probably as long as, and if not longer, that the United States has been in existence. And so the truth of the matter is whether it's scientific racism or the mistreatment of people in during healthcare encounters, we've seen disproportionate access to healthcare providers who can really listen and, and believe patients, healthcare providers who can recognize signs and symptoms of deterioration and to be able to get people the care that they need. In addition to everything from the disparities and what we see in terms of health insurance coverage, when we see that we know that health insurance in and of itself as an intervention improves health outcomes, but we still have states that did not expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, and we still have people who think that, that we shouldn't even have the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, when you look at it at all levels, whether the individual all the way to the structural, Black people have not fared well within our health system. And in fact, we see that mistreatment really is, has, it, it kills Black Americans. And so the truth of the matter is, the pandemic has done nothing but exacerbate what was already in existence. Hmm. Yeah, um, we we have so much to get to. <laughs> I feel like I, I, I'm <laughs> feeling it in my soul. Um, uh, I really am. We have so many people we want to talk to as yes. well. We're just starting here. Yes, yeah, so we have so much to dive into. So still ahead here, we are taking your messages on social media. Our colleague Kamasi Aaron is upstairs right now pulling it all from social media. So please be a, a part of this conversation with us. We yeah. really want to hear from you. Absolutely. So we're going to take a quick break here, but we are going to continue on our Facebook platform. So for those watching us on TV, we'll be back in a moment.
Okay, we are up now. So we are still on Facebook. We want to continue this conversation. This question for Deborah Gorman. I wanted to talk more about the decades of disinvestment in our community, what that has looked like, and how can we change that? Well, thank you. I too want to um, acknowledge the group here and the, uh, the work of everybody and reach out to the um, uh, essential workers from the bus drivers to the healthcare workers to our grocery store people. So um, thank you for allowing this conversation. Uh, well, green lining actually is built on the concept of the red lining, which was the economic, you know, um, the way to keep black folks and people of color um, away from home ownership and economic opportunity. Um, so everything that we approach is from a racial equity lens. And when we're looking at the um, coronavirus and what's happening, you know, it really seems to be happening on two fronts. Um, there's the exposure to the virus and then there's the vulnerability. And if you think about both of those, you know, the, the exposure, if you're a essential worker, or where you live, if you're a homeless, if you are, um, you know, when you say sheltering in and you don't have some places, people of color and then the vulnerability aspect is you know pre-existing health and conditions dr mcmore already pointed out um social determinants of health there was the aces study that you know adverse uh, childhood experiences I'm going to have really to stop you here for just one moment because we do have sure. to come back online for our tv sure. folks so just hang with us one moment and we will get back to the conversation as soon as we're back on air Thank you to ABC7 for holding this town hall. We know the African American community has been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus throughout the United States. Through our equity team, we are doing everything we can to support our community through outreach and resources here in our city. Forums like this are really important for sharing information during what we know is a really challenging time. Let's get through this together by staying informed and staying safe. That was San Francisco Mayor London Breed. Now let's go to ABC7 News anchor Kumasi Aaron live at the social desk. Hi Kumasi. Hey guys, we are getting a lot of feedback about Dr. McLemore and the points that she's bringing up. Jen, Le Jen Miller mentioned that it's a lack of resources for some black communities. For some reason, the medical professional profession doesn't treat us the same. She says there's no sense of urgency, no sense of concern. And then she shared a personal story saying her knee surgery is far, so far away, but a coworker was able to get that surgery much sooner. And so a lot of people are just thinking about the discrepancies that they face in their day-to-day -day lives. Also, Giovanni Coleman has a question that I'd like to pose to the panel. She says, what policies should be in place at the state level to help address the needs in the black community that have been exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic? This would include access and equity in the educational and healthcare systems and worker protections needed in retail and service industries, you guys. Mm. All right. That is a perfect question, actually, to send to Representative Barbara Lee, who is with us today. So the question from one of our viewers is about what statewide policies should be in play here to help our community during this COVID-19 pandemic. Sure. Well, let me uh, thank you very much for having this conversation. I, too, want to uh, thank and give gratitude to our essential workers, our frontline workers. I want to include our postal workers, everyone who really... Uh, are out there protecting the health and safety of all of us and they deserve every every protective measures that we can provide and so I just want to salute them and thank them very much just know at the federal level we're working very hard to make sure that your your life is secure let me uh, mention a couple of things uh, just as it relates and you know I was in the California legislature for uh, seven and a half years and so at the state level quite frankly I think um, you know California is leading in so many respects, but I think we can really uh, focus on target, at, and the same at the federal level, targeting resources to where the disparities right now, as it relates to COVID-19, are the greatest. Uh, one, with rapid response tests. Uh, two, with making sure the contact tracing is there immediately, so that, uh, because as was said earlier, we live with multi-generational families, and so we might have to make sure that if uh, that we can find the proper housing uh, for uh, isolation. 
And so we have to do that. And we have to have the, the uh, equitable treatment and care. Now, at the, again, I have to speak more from the federal level because I, I, we're working on legislation now. And I know the California legislature is also working on it. But we have to make sure that we collect the data. And I'm looking at the data uh, from the national level and at the state level as it relates to COVID-19. And we see communities of color, people of color, disproportionately represented in the transmission of the virus as well as the deaths. And uh, in the African-American community, Latino community, we're almost twice the population that's infected and, and die. And so we have to have at the state and federal level targeted resources to the most impacted communities. And if we don't do that, uh, we'll never deal with the, all of the issues in this emergency. But in addition to the emergency, we have to move forward after this pandemic is over and, and begin to really deal with the social determinants and what was said earlier in terms of the legacy, unfortunately, of the Middle Passage and, and of slavery, and that's real. Uh, so many people believe this is uh, a post-racial society. It's not, and unfortunately now all of these gaps and these disparities and this damage is surfacing. And so at the state level, we have to move very quickly to do the rapid response testing, contact tracing, isolation, and finding the proper housing so that people can live in, in a way that makes sense and that's healthy for them and their families. May I add one other thought? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jump in, jump on it. It's a conversation. Um, uh, there were statistics out that said 90% of businesses owned by people of color are not going to get those payroll protection loans. You have these multinational corporations, five, Fortune 500 corporations, sucking up the money, and people of color who own businesses aren't getting this at all. So we're getting devastated by this. There's one particular initiative that's before the state legislature on Tuesday to reinstate the use of race goals and timetables so that when the companies start coming back online, we can start getting government contracts to businesses owned by people of color. And so this is ACA5. There's a coalition called the Opportunity for All Coalition, four as a Roman numeral. Greenlining is involved. And so if you're interested, go to our website and get the people to vote to reinstate affirmative action. We hope it will be on the ballot in November. And this is a conscious way to redress the imbalance that we're seeing. Yes. We're dying. We are dying. Yeah, I've got to just weigh in very quickly because I was in the legislature and fought tooth and nail against Prop 209. And what we have seen now here in this state of California is the total rollback. Of, of any type of equity and parity in state house, in state uh, contracting, also in state employment at our universities. When you look at the University of California system, I think UC Berkeley barely has 3% African-American student population. And so this is so important to support. And I join you in that effort. Thank you. Right. You're my Congress woman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to bring in Charles Collins so we can talk a little more about the youth. Charles, you are the president and CEO of YMCA of San Francisco. Talk about what you're seeing on just a personal level. We talk about the numbers. We talk about the trends. But you see people. You're seeing them face to face every day. Our community helping them. How are you seeing this play out? Well, I have to join the chorus of appreciation for having this opportunity to address this important subject. You know, the YMCA is founded on the trust and safety of young people. Our entire future rests on how we treat children right now. Coordination is absolutely needed, and each one of these panelists has really talked from a different point of view, but where it really comes into focus is our children. Our children are the ones who have no voice. They're the ones who grow up with these social determinants stacked against them in housing that does not have the resources, in educational systems that can't address their particular needs, in food deserts, in places of stress, and also in places where the family does not really have the resources in order to nurture the child. Right now, we're facing an educational crisis in America. The gap of learning that has happened with, let's call it our typical population, it's one thing when it's black people or poor people. It's another thing when everybody is experiencing this. So there is a certain part of this that is indiscriminate, and it is also exacerbated. Mm -hmm. So from the YMCA's perspective, we were on the ground from day one. We never closed our doors. 
We have been helping families of the essential workers to be able to, where are their kids going to the YMCA? And where are they going to go when school's out to the YMCA and other providers? The YMCA is not alone in this, but the entire youth serving sector is really marshaled now to deal with what we call the war against COVID. But let me also say, and I wanna say this because we have a type of leadership in San Francisco in, in our Bay Area and with our representative, Barbara Lee, that is incre incredibly progressive. They understand how to coordinate. We know where a lot of these issues are. But one of the things that we have to do learning from this is to see how we can better coordinate with this. The, our children are facing these issues right now and they only have one time to be a child. And so what we wanna do is to look at these issues of food deserts and insecurity, uh, the historical issues that they've had to live with in achievement gaps caused largely because schools don't know how to address their needs. Is it that the child is wrong or is it the learning system needs to adapt? And so what everyone is saying here is this COVID crisis has really exposed the soft underbelly of what has been there and has still needing for incredible levels of coordination to work out of this. I would also add that we can build resilience out of this. I mean, Dr. McLemore is talking about, you know, what do we do about this? How do we build advocates from within our own communities that understand what they need and that they go to the halls of justice hospitals, the education system, and our leadership to redress this at a very, very important time. Because right now, we're looking at COVID. What's around the corner? How about climate? Mm -hmm. try, that, try that one on. Try, mm -hmm. try on how indiscriminate climate will be. Mm -hmm. It's going to hit vulnerable populations and make COVID look like a, a twerk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head in terms of like, you know, the disproportionate way that this is impacting our community. But there are things we can be doing like right now. You know, we can make sure that people who have, you know, women and children, the WIC program can get their food online or get their food delivered to them. We can make sure that, you know, people can have safe birth outside of hospitals and make mm -hmm. sure that our current doula workforce is not decimated because of shelter in place. We've already shown that people can get a basic minimum income. We've already shown that we can have national licensure for nurses and physicians so we can cross state lines and help each other out. That should remain permanent. And let's get on the telehealth visits. You know, prior to COVID, a lot of people don't understand that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services would not reimburse for telehealth. And now all of a sudden, a pandemic hits and we can have telehealth. Why don't we make that permanent? Yeah, a lot Why of people are conversations. A lot of about people are permanence? taking part in those telehealth. I did it for the first time last week. Oh, so wow. we want to continue this conversation. We do have to take a short break, though. Yes, you are a part of this. ABC 7 listens Town Hall 2. Go to Facebook to weigh in and interact in today's virtual town hall. Stay with us. If you don't like something, change it. And if you can't change it, change your attitude. I'm ABC7 News reporter Julian Glover, and those are the words of the incredible Maya Angelou. You know, the reality is none of us like the situation that we're in, and we wish we could change it. This coronavirus disproportionately affecting black and brown communities, we can't change it, so we have to change our attitudes towards it. We have to take this thing seriously. We have to go see our doctors as soon as we start feeling unwell. And we also have to listen to our public health leaders for the best ways to keep ourselves safe and also to protect our families. We can get through this together when we listen and then take action. All right. Hello, Facebook. Thank you all so much for continuing to uh, stream this and stay with us for this important conversation. Yes, so we are going to continue to drive the conversation. And actually, uh, you, Jobina, had a follow-up question you wanted to ask. Yeah, thank you, Amma. I did. Um, for Charles, you were talking about our kids, and there was a statistic you provided for us from the YMCA that I was really struck by. You say 47% uh, of black children in San Francisco live below the federal poverty level versus 3% of white children. Those are some incredible numbers for people that are watching right now that need help in this moment and have children and are a part of this 47% that we're talking about, where can they go? Is there anything the YMCA is doing right now? Sure. 
I mean, if we look at systems and we look at structural poverty, we can see the outcome of that are children that are living at or below the poverty line. I mean, this is a, a, a very difficult problem in San Francisco because we have a history of long-term racism here. You know, Eva Patterson fought the firefighters in order to bring justice and bring more jobs there. After World War II, black people were excluded from workforces as Johnny came running back home, and we didn't have any sort of integration in terms of the workforce. And so we look at the system of redevelopment that has been behind this. And we were talking about Deborah Gorman saying, you know, the racism in housing. So what we're seeing is the bitter harvest of economic factors that have been a gener a generations old. Okay, now, Charles, how do we I'm sorry, out? we're going to have to stop real quick, but we are going to pick it back up. So please don't forget your thought because we are going to bring it back on. You're watching Race and Coronavirus, a Bay Area conversation. Listen, let's speak the truth. This coronavirus, COVID-19, has disproportionately impacted Black people in America and has only highlighted the racial disparities that existed long before this pandemic. So let's speak the truth about it. This week, I introduced a racial disparities task force that needs to be created to study this and to also make sure we're distributing resources to the people who need them. Thank you. All right, that was Senator Kamala Harris with a message to our ABC7 viewers. I'm Kumasi. Can you tell us a little bit about what people are talking about right now at the social desk? Well, oh, Javina and Alma, people are really connecting, just saying that this COVID-19 pandemic has really brought to light some of these issues that have been bubbling under the surface, the inequality and equity, um, and COVID-19 is really bringing that to light. People, Monica Mondi said this is not a new problem, and a lot of people believe that communities of color are being left to deal with this illness without help. So I think a lot of people um, have questions about that, and then also, um, Velma Wilson said that she's really glad we're doing this town hall because she has a family member who right now is fighting coronavirus and has been fighting it for five weeks. And she kind of feels like young people, young adults may not have uh, taken this seriously and are not taking this seriously. And she just wants to stress the importance of that. And I wonder if that's something that our panelists can touch on because I think it can be sometimes young people. It can be sometimes, I remember at the beginning of this, we thought that Black people weren't getting coronavirus until all these numbers came out. And I think now that's something that's been proven to be wrong, yet some of those um, mindsets still remain. So I don't know if that's something that the panelists can touch on. Hmm, definitely. Okay, well, when we jump back into our panel here, I, it also really ties in with what Charles Collins was talking to us about earlier when we were on Facebook streaming. Uh, we were talking about our children. For our television viewers that missed the statistic, 47% of black children in San Francisco live below the federal poverty line versus 3% of white children. We were talking about resources. Kumasi is hearing from our viewers. Uh, they feel uh, that maybe some younger people aren't taking this seriously. Charles, you were really on a roll with your answer here as far as how people right now in this moment that are a part of this group can get help. What has caused that 47% to rest on the shoulders of our young people? We're looking at the weight of history. And we, when we look at the weight of history, we look at the systems that have prevented black people and other people of color from getting decent jobs. It's crazy because we live in a place of incredible invention. We are in the technological capital of the world. We are where medical engineering and other types of innovations are really changing the face of it. But are we connected into it? Are black people connected into the economy of the future when they're weighted by the history of the past? And our children have to really be able to see through this. And in order for us to address the issue of our children, we have to understand the multicultural nature of our community. Now, our unified school district is doing a phenomenal job, and they're doing this with a lot of other resources and as community partners to our school district, as community partners to our public health system and to our Department of Children, Youth, and their families. It will take an incredible amount of coordination for us to overcome the history of economic segregation. Now, how that relates into the future, I think we have a lot of opportunities to connect the dots.
All right. And can I just add? Oh, yes, go ahead. Well, Jump on in. Uh, so I, let me just chime in with Chuck. I mean, how can we, you know, as um, Black people, trust the system? I'm over policed. I'm arrested. I, you know, if I'm barbecue, Betty at the lake is going to arrest me. Or if uh, I'm in school and I'm tossed out of school because young Black girls are disruptive, I go to the healthcare system and they tell me I have a higher tolerance plane as a Black woman. I don't fundamentally, culturally trust the government and the, the, the systems that are in place. So of course, when information is shared, I'm not necessarily going to give it any credibility. So I think what, what the solutions is, as um, Representative Lee has pointed out, in addition to focusing on those who have need, I think we have to center race on it. Because you have to go to the communities, even uh, Dr. McMore mentioned uh, telehealth. Well, if there's a digital divide and I don't have it don't matter what you tell me about digital or if you tell my kids that now we're going to homeschool and get your class online, we ain't got a desktop or a laptop and I'm going to do it on a phone. So there, there's just structural, the racialization of the system. So I think we got to center those who have the need and we have the data so we know where the need is and then we have to center race. Can I riff off that? because several people have alluded to structural racism. And if you look at what Chuck was saying, the system was never set up to help black people. Let's look at what happened after the depression. You had the GI Bill, Social Security, unemployment, but black people, domestics, farm workers were explicitly excluded from that. Let's fast forward to last week. We have a payroll protection plan. It's supposed to get money to businesses, small businesses, yet 90% of businesses owned by people of color were shut out of that program. You have these big Fortune 500 multinational corporations getting the money. So once again, people of color are not taken care of by the political system. So we need to look at the political dynamics of this. It goes beyond race. It goes to a corrupt political system where lobbyists looked at the stimulus bill before the Democrats did and before the public did. And you saw that they were scooping up all this money for tax breaks and the like. So there's something <laughs> wrong here, not just for people of color, but for people who aren't rich. So we should have a broad coalition of people trying to change things. Okay, so we are gonna jump in. I'm gonna stop you just right there because we do wanna continue the conversation, but we are going to take a short break on our race and coronavirus, a Bay Area conversation. We do want you to join in the conversation at home as well. You are a part of this ABC7 Listens Town Hall as well. Go to YouTube and Facebook to weigh in and you can interact with today's virtual town hall. We will be right back. The safest thing you can do right now is shelter in place, stay home. For those of you not able to shelter in place or stay home, wear a mask and maintain a distance of six feet between yourselves and others when you are outside. Those of you who are not able to social distance due to housing restrictions, spatial restrictions, do everything you can, go that extra step to keep yourselves and those you love feeling cared for and protected and safe. Help others wherever, whenever you can. Raised in coronavirus, huh? Man, check game. When, when, I can't wait for outside to open up, but when it do, man, you know what I'm talking about? It's back to the regular schedule program, man. You feel? But anyway, I've been spending time with the family. It's always a good thing to do that. I love to do that anyway. All right. Oh, gotta well, love you for it. I know, right? That went on for 50. <laughs> for 53 seconds, Salma. We'll it's worth watching. <laughs> You'll be tuning into that later. Okay, so I want to continue the conversation here on Facebook. Jobina's here with me. I want to talk to Pendarvis Harshad. Actually, since we just saw E40 giving that message, do you feel like the we need more people like him, I guess you could say, to help reach certain people who maybe aren't taking this seriously? I mean, we got to reach people on all levels, correct? I hear what you're saying. It's about having somebody who's relatable, who's yes, somebody who's relatable. A young audience. If you look at the statistics in Alameda County right now, the lion's share of cases are amongst 18 to 40 year olds. And mm -hmm. that's an age group who grew up, at least for the past 10 years, was not trusting the government because of 
police violence, video after video after video on social media. So if that's the front line of the government that's speaking to me about what I should do to care for myself, I'm not going to hear that. What I'm, what, what I'm seeing working is people like Jamal Trulove, a young man who's out of Bayview, out of San Francisco. He's pounding the pavement every day, uh, passing out hand sanitizer and masks in the projects in San Francisco and also going to the prisons. And that he has star power. He's been an actor. He's been an artist. He's very well known for a big court case. He's a hood star. And he's somebody in the neighborhood who can reach me. That's what's needed. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. We really got to get people who can, who others will listen to. We can get the message out there, but we got to have a lot of different channels. Now, we're going to come back on air in just a moment. So all of you Facebook friends, hang with us for one second. We're going to come back on air in just a moment. Hi, Robin here, coming to you from my makeshift home studio for GMA. Like many of you in the Bay Area, I'm sheltering at home. The reason being, I have a compromised immune system because of my cancer treatment, not once, but twice. But as an African American, I'm also at a higher risk. That's why it is so important that you're having your town hall on race and coronavirus. Proud of you for having this conversation. Yes, together we will get through this. This too shall pass. So let's continue to focus on the fight and not the fright. Ah, great words. I'm Ama. This is Jobina and Kumasi still here <laughs> with me. And we have our panel. That was Robin Roberts from Good Morning America. In the break, we were talking to uh, Pendarvis Harshaw with KQED. And I want to go back to him now. Pendarvis, you had a piece I read about hypertension in a pandemic. And this is something I think we really need to look at for when we come out on the other side of this. There are so many people who are so scared to get COVID-19 that they are not going to their doctor for regular maintenance on their health problems. And this is a scary situation. Talk more about what you found. Yeah, in that piece, it's a personal exploration of really how I'm taking in everything. You know, being a journalist, I'm reading the news constantly and I begin to get stressed. And when I get stressed, I stress eat. And so I go toward fatty foods or salt or liquor. And that isn't good. That brings about hypertension. And hypertension is one of the uh, pre-existing conditions that brings about COVID. And so we talk about um, health care. It's not in, in a large scope of things. Um, what I really wanted to talk about is uh, readdressing the philosophy that, or our approach to health care. So with the assistance of Dr. Noha uh, from Roots Community Health Clinic in uh, Oakland, California, um, I really got to the heart of how I could possibly make some personal changes that could just lead to health, healthier outcomes for myself. Hmm. Pendarvis, also, um, I read that same piece. You mentioned in there something that, uh, to be quite frank, a lot of black people joke about, uh, that our relatives drink ginger ale and think that that's going to make us feel better, uh, that black people don't go to the doctor, all of these cultural things, right, uh, that are very serious. And when you have a pandemic, it exacerbates that. Can you just speak to what you're finding in the community, what you're seeing? I follow you all over social media. You're on the ground. You're talking with everybody right now. What's the pulse? Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people are really um, taking it upon themselves to look at their own healthy habits or lack thereof um, and really question what really works. It's wild. I've never seen so many people post on social media about eating sea moss. Like, uh, it, that's the new hot way. As, um, <laughs> They're concerned about, you know, lungs, and this is what they've read on the internet is that's that's right. going to benefit their respiratory health, and so people are taking action such as that. And um, again, kind of, uh, I think this week what I'm looking at is further um, changing our philosophy in terms of healthcare. I had a conversation with a woman who practiced traditional Chinese medicine in Berkeley. She took a trip to Navajo uh, Nation and mm -hmm. told me about the overlap in philosophy between traditional Chinese medicine and indigenous medicine and how it's about not necessarily preventative, but medicine for life, as opposed to what we have in the American healthcare system where it's like medicine to fend off death. Um, and just that concept of like, let's, let's be healthy from the start. Um, it's something that we can take on ourselves as, as an individual. We don't have to depend on legislation to pass or big healthcare systems or big pharma. Wow. But but let me jump on, on, on that comment, because I think it's an important one to make. I mean, 
We also have to sort of recognize and acknowledge that going back to what I was talking about in terms of our public health infrastructure being accurate scientific information that's coming out of the CDC and the White House, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and so you ha we have to address this whole idea that, you know, again, we need people who can take care of us. Reminder, right? I work at one of the largest public institutions in the city and county of San Francisco. We are at an exclusively health sciences campus. I always explain to people, I am the fifth black person in the 114 year history of the School of Nursing who has received tenure, the fifth, okay? We need diversification of the healthcare workforce if we're really going to get at some of these foundational and fundamental issues. And the thing that really bothers me most about the numbers coming out of Alameda County Yes, you're absolutely correct. Those people are 18 to 44. And not only are they the people that have been disproportionately exposed to police shootings and all the social media stuff, they're also the people of reproductive age. And so as we think about, you know, the impact, these are the healthiest people usually in the health system. And so if they're having negative experiences when they're seeking their health care, that's going to have lifelong implications. Yeah. So again, Let's it comes back to, to, like to add something here and really ahead, talk about, about the voice of young people. Because I've seen young people actually create change in real time. We passed a soda tax about three years ago, Bay Area wide. And one of the leading groups of proponents for that were children and youth of color. Latino, Latinx, African Americans challenged the issue that were brought to us by the industrialized beverage industry that was selling poison down the throats of our children. And our kids became informed. They worked with the University of California at San Francisco. And they rose up to say to their family members, don't listen to the beverage industry. Don't listen to those people that are selling you poison and vote for a tax. Now, that tax has been in place in San Francisco for three years and is providing health education to young people to be able to fight other systems where they really need to understand, you know, what is behind why they are where they are. Yeah. So we need, Charles, we need I trust think that people Charles. are talking about this. Sorry to cut you off, Congresswoman. Uh, uh -huh. ABC7 <laughs> News anchor Kumasi Aaron is at the okay. social desk, and people are talking about the same thing there. So I want to take it upstairs to Kumasi about what you're hearing. They really are, Jobina. One person says, no one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. So echoing that tone of personal responsibility, even though, though we know there are these underlying systemic issues. And Frank Franklin said, I'm a healthy 70-year-old black man born in the Bay Area. I have all Always taken care of myself and went to the gym. Your health is your problem. To many of us, we do not take care of our health or well-being. So I think there is just people who are um, also talking about personal responsibility while also acknowledging that there are issues within the system. LaDonna Thomas said it's more about the people who are making decisions. Systems are in place that can be used to advance people of color and help people of color but are yet denied. So we need to look at decision makers. So so a call there to hold people accountable, you guys. All right. Thank you so much, Kumasi. Everyone stay with us. Hi, everyone. This is Jaron Collins of the Golden State Warriors, encouraging everybody to stay home, stay safe. There's a lot that we don't know about this current pandemic, but we do know is that listening to our governor, listening to the mayors, that we are better off staying at home. We'll get through this together, Bay Area. All right. Welcome back to our Facebook and YouTube viewers who are checking in with us. We are going to continue with our panel discussion while we're in break for about a minute and a half until we go back on TV. Right. So with that minute and a half, I really want to get our Congresswoman back in here because you were just about to say uh, something about our young people. And I also, because we have a minute and a half and our Facebook viewers understand, we're probably going to end up stopping you, but then we want you to pick it back up on television again. So Congresswoman Lee. Sure. Sure, what I'm, what I'm saying is we need to have trusted uh, messengers who can deliver health care education messages. I spoke with Mayor Lightfoot in Chicago last week, for example. They are hiring former gang members to deliver messages as it relates to COVID-19, and it's beginning to work. Speaking uh, with regard to CDC and some of the, in many ways, uh, misinformation that's coming out, my colleague in New York uh, advised us of this. African Americans are showing up uh, based on CDC's re requirements and protocols 
uh, with one or two maybe of the symptoms. They're sending them home and they're dying. 4,000 people last week at home died, primarily African-Americans, but yet they're following what CDC guidelines say. So this stuff is deep, it's structural, and we have to see it from a race and economic lens. Otherwise, we'll never get through these type of uh, gaps and disparities and uh, really uh, huge, horrific, uh, real uh, dangers that uh, our communities have, have faced since the beginning of time in this country. Thank All right, you so stay with us. We're coming right back on air. The coronavirus is ravaging through our communities, killing us in numbers that are just staggering. It is heartbreaking, it is gut-wrenching. But we are a strong people. For generations, our ancestors have gone through unspeakable adversity with enormous strength and amazing grace. Now, I know this is hard, I know this is scary, but I wanna encourage you to stay home, to stay informed, to stay connected with family and friends near and far, to stay hopeful, and yes, to stay strong. We're in this together. Mm. Right now, she has grace too, right? Mm -hmm. And she's another one of those who can really reach the people who need to be hearing the message right now. Yeah. And guys, I'm still up here um, getting so much feedback from people on Facebook, uh, people watching on YouTube. And one of the questions deals with education. This is from Karen Holder Jackson. And she says, I'm sad about the education system. Parents are supposed to homeschool, but what if parents haven't been to school since high school or did not finish high school? What, um, what about black parents that didn't go to college or continue to keep upgrading their skills? They are not in the position to homeschool their children. So I think this just speaks to just the disparity when it comes to education, whether it's this or whether it's access to technology, Wi-Fi, uh, computers, whatever it might be, as a lot of uh, black students and students all around the Bay Area are not in school right now. So I don't know if someone on the panel can address that um, issue that we're facing and we're seeing here. Yeah, I think possibly uh, Charles Collins, because Charles at the YMCA, I'm sorry, you didn't hear the question, but the question from one of our viewers was about kids are supposed to be homeschooling right now. Parents are taking the lead on that, but what if the parent didn't graduate from college? What if they didn't even graduate from high school? How are they supposed to continue helping the youth learn when they're not in school? And I know you guys have a family resource center for parenting help. Is that one of those things that people can take advantage of in this sort of situation? I think a lot of the time, a lot of times people don't realize some of these resources are out there and that they can take advantage of this and help them. There are resources out there, and those resources are there to really help families in particular that don't have the Wi-Fi, say the broadband or the computing skills. But let me say also right now, in this moment, in this day, the YMCA of San Francisco is touching 10,000 young people. Right now, we are doing out-of-school time learning and engaging them because we can't wait. And so we're bridging that digital divide. We're looking at the achievement gap. And this summer of that 47% that we were talking about early of kids in poverty, we will have specifically 1,300 of them to close the achievement gap with them. This can't wait. This is not about assigning responsibility elsewhere. This is where everyone on this panel is saying <clears throat> some part of this is where we take the problem in our own hands and we solve it. And so in almost every dimension, whether it's looking at the gap in healthcare, I agree with Representative Lee. We have peer health advisors that come from within the community that understand the context of the community. We have people who are teaching our children because they love these kids. They love the, the opportunity to watch them grow. Kids only get to be five years old for one minute. And so this is not something that we can stand on time and say, we're going to wait for the future. So I would say right now, trust your community-based organizations to work with your public organizations, the school district, our phenomenal mayor, our public health system, because this is about how we come together, not balkanize, but community-based organizations understand the context of their communities. They understand who is where and what is where. And so it's about leveraging the strength of that 
to the benefit of the children so that we begin to break these cycles that we've really been talking about. Charles, that leads and perfectly Ch into. Um, oops, sorry to cut you right there, uh, Dr. McLemore. I'm We're sorry. Run into I'm, our. Oh, do you want? Do you have something super quick? Uh, just a really quick yes, piece to ahead. this. You know, one <laughs> of the things that we're doing at UCSF, and we just announced this earlier this week, because you're absolutely right. In the data that we're collecting around people who have been exposed to COVID or persons under investigation for COVID, we just received money, my team and I, to really develop a reproductive health equity and birth justice core which will work directly with community-based organizations who are working with people of reproductive age to really not only get money in the hands of Black people who can, can do contact tracing, who can help us with what the social needs are, can get digital devices with data plans in the hands of folks, but also be able to really try to find out like what else do people need in order long-term and how to be able to maintain their health and how can we work so that the data ad adequately represents, you know, our, our proportions, not only the population, but then what questions do community members have that they want to ask? And that, that is really specific to taking care of Speaking of community leaders, I want to ask, I'm sorry, we got to go right to commercial, but it's about our Take Action platform. So we are going to get back to Dr. McLemore because I know she was on a roll there. To take action, log on to our website. It's abc7news.com slash take action. There are links to resources about everything we are talking about here on issues of racism, dealing with your health, all of it. We will be right back after this break. Okay, we are back on Facebook, everyone, and I want to bring back Dr. McLemore. I'm so sorry to cut you off. You know I'm a big fan. <laughs> so, I, well, I, I, oh, go ahead. I just, it's I so appreciate. <laughs> yeah, I totally appreciate the brain trust on on this whole webinar. And Pendarvis was just about to make a super important point because, and I hope he will make it, um, is that you know this is happening on multiple layers, right? I mean, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. And black people have innovated in the time of oppression since the beginning of time. And we can thrive. We know how to exist. And we know how to make this better and come out of this better. And so the truth of the matter is, you know, as we think through what supports do people need now, what supports are people going to need moving forward in the future? We actually can plan for that now, right? We know or we suspect that there will be an economic recession that might follow this based on our shelter in place, based on decisions that we've made to make sure our populations can stay safe. Okay. So how are we going to ensure that we have a future black workforce that can return to being, you know, thriving and supporting community members if the community based organizations, then them and of themselves are fighting for resources. How yeah. can we be thinking about that now to get them what they need? Yeah. Also, we have to think about now the census and the census is so important. We've got to make sure that even during this COVID emergency that our people yes fill out the census because that's going to determine a heck of a lot. And there are those who do not want us to do that. And it is extremely important that we take this moment and recognize that. All We're going to interrupt you just one moment as we come back on air. Such a lively conversation. We wish we could just continue on. We want to thank all of our panel experts for taking the, the time out of their busy schedules today to talk with us and with you about race and coronavirus. It's only the beginning of an important conversation, but it is definitely one worth having. This town hall and taking all of your questions and comments has taught us just how important it is for our voices to all be shared. Kumasi, you want to give us your fun? Yeah, I, I just really appreciated um, all of you taking the time out to be a part of this with us because we wanted this to be interactive. We wanted to know what you were thinking about before this started, during all of this conversation, and you really delivered. And I'm so happy that we were able to share, and thank you for being a part of it. Certainly. Uh, my final word for tonight, I just want to say I'm thankful. I'm thankful to work at a station that isn't afraid to have these types of conversations to put this many black faces on TV at one time, <laughs> because let's be honest, a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. And for the brilliant minds that we had on this panel, I'm so thankful for them speaking with us. And just, I used to think you had to be 
sometimes the smartest. You could be the most educated, and maybe if you had the most money, you could be saved. And we have seen that that is not true. So I've seen in my own family that that is not true. And I think it's a multi-layered approach that we've talked about that can create some change. All right, and I just wanted to say, you know, African, Asian, young, old, we are all human. Anyone can be infected with COVID-19. However, every one of us can also make a difference. Although we're socially distant, what's important now more than ever is that we stay closely connected. Call your neighbor, check in on your aunts and uncles. How's their health? Do they need medical care or maybe food dropped off? It's easy to focus on protecting ourselves, but let's not forget to protect each other. We truly are all in this together. And frankly, we will only get out of this together. Yes, the conversation will continue next Thursday at 4 p.m. We will focus on the issues in the Latino community and what they're facing right now. Catch Race and Coronavirus, a Bay Area conversation, May 7th at 4 p.m. right here on ABC7. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for joining us. ABC7 News at 5 is coming up next.